14. I'm going to read from 14 all the way down uh, to the end of the chapter. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to it, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll look at this. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for making it known to us, helping us to understand who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, I pray that you would give us the understanding of our responsibility of the ministry that we have here uh, after we are born again. We are yours and we are to be uh, serving you in the way you want us to. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I see three things here. Number one, we see an obligation to God. Uh, and then we see because of because of the second point, um, the cr- new creation. We are a new creation, which gives us the obligation or puts us in that position of the obligation. And then uh, toward the end of this uh, section, we see that we have a responsibility to uh, be ministers of reconciliation, reconciliation to God. And I know I covered that uh, rec- reconciliation uh, and redemption about well, probably a month or two ago in uh, the services, but we'll look at it again here uh, in this particular passage. So for number one, the, our obligation to God, notice in verse verses 14 and 15, he says, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So being obligated, uh, what does constraineth mean? For the love of Christ constraineth us. Does anybody know what constrain means? Don't let him go. What's that? Don't let him go. Don't let him go. You, you know that, that that's that's right. To constrain somebody is is in a sense restrain, but uh, it's not uh, it's not a, a trap. But to constrain something is a pressure. Okay, don't let him go. Um, I I can't think of um, who it was, but somebody. I think it might have been Lydia in the uh, New Testament, the Book of Acts, when Paul and uh, his um, people who he was with and they ministered to the people at the riverside and Lydia came to know Christ as her savior she constrained them to stay with her and so she didn't trap them she didn't tie them up and restrain them but she in a sense pressured them to stay and so the love of Christ he says constrains us we're this might sound bad but we're under pressure okay and it's the type of pressure that God uh, lays on our heart. Go over to the book of Acts, and we'll see a different time. Acts chapter um, 18. Paul is, is traveling on his missionary trips, and he ends up in, uh, he doesn't end up there, but he, he comes to uh, the city of Athens, and we know that he preached to the people at, the, at Areopagus there in the, the city of Athens. But while he was there, he was uh, waiting for Silas and Timothy to come. Verse number five. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, 
Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. That word pressed there is the same word uh, that means com uh, constrained. So Paul was constrained. He was pressured. Now, you might, you might think that in the, in the spirit means that the Holy Spirit pressured him. There's a, there's a possibility that that was there, but it, it was Paul's own spirit. He, he saw the need of these people. And, uh, of course, God reveals things to us, and the Holy Spirit probably revealed the need. And so he was pressed or constrained in his own spirit to reach out to them and, and teach them that Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, was the Messiah that the, that the Jews have been looking for for a thousand years, uh, the one to come from God. So uh, he, was, he was constrained. And so back in 2 Corinthians Five, when we see that uh, uh, we are constrained, he says it's because of what Christ has done for us. We are constrained because of the love that God has for us. And you might also add our love for Christ. If we didn't love Christ like we should, would we ever be constrained or pressed to minister for him? Uh, our love is also part of that love. The love of Christ can mean both uh, his love for us or our love for him. But he says uh, it's that love that pushes us into uh, doing or uh, working for the Lord. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul the Apostle recognized when he when he came to faith in Jesus Christ, he, he recognized uh, his sinfulness. And remember in, uh, it's either 1 Timothy or Titus, I'm not sure, it might be 2 Timothy. He said, uh, um, Christ died for sinners. I think that's the way he put it. He says, of whom I am chief. What does that mean, chief? Number one, it's like he's saying, I I am a, I'm a bigger sinner than anybody else in the world. And so he recognized what he was saved from, his sin, and he recognized what kind of person he was uh, uh, against God, against, uh, actually he didn't know he was against God, he was against Christians. And so he, his ministry to preach and teach the gospel was very strong in him. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse number 16. He says, for, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Now he's not saying that, that woe, when he says woe is unto me, he's not saying uh, God's going to judge me or God's going to do something against me because if I don't preach the gospel. It's in his own heart. He recognizes, uh, and he says, um, their um, necessity is laid upon me. He says, this is, this is what God has done for me, and now it's a, it's a necessary thing for me to preach the gospel. It's very important that I do this. For my own heart, he says, in, in this case, woe is unto me. I would look down on myself if I did not preach the gospel that God wants me to preach. And so maybe we don't have the same heart that Paul did, but the Bible teaches that we don't belong to ourselves. Uh, look over at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. He says we're debtors not to the flesh. Well, if we're not debtors to the flesh, then we must be debtors to the Spirit. What is a debtor? One who owes. Now, we can we talk about if people are in debt today. Normally, we're thought, talking about uh, they owe a bunch of money to different people. 
interest. And it, it, even if it's interest, we owe, oh, okay, we are debtors. So here he says, we're not debtors to the flesh. So apparently it's something else that we're debtors to. We owe something to someone. And what we owe that we can never repay in this case. What we owe to God is our lives because he has done so much for us. And so this is what he's saying. Um, we can never repay Jesus Christ. We can never repay God for what God did to us. Mainly, not, not, and there's two, we can think of two reasons why we can never repay it. Number one, it was such a high price to pay. What, what would we have done if we had to pay for our own sin? End up in the lake, the lake of fire forever and ever, because that's the only way, because it's an infinite price. The other reason um, we can't repay it is because it's a gift. How many of you have paid somebody else for a gift that they've given to you? If you have paid them for it, then it's not a gift. You might buy yourself a gift, but what's that? You paid for it, right? But um, if somebody gives you something like, like God gave to us, the gift of eternal life, even if we wanted to pay for it, it would be wrong to try because it's a gift. And so uh, in a sense, when we look at it that way as a gift, we really don't owe God for our salvation. But we are debtors to the Spirit to live for the Lord because uh, we don't belong to ourselves. Look again at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6 and look at verse number 19. What? <laughs> know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you which ye have of God and ye are not your own that you have the Holy Spirit in you because God put the Holy Spirit there when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And since you are saved and you have the, the Holy Spirit, there is a gift. There is that spirit in you. And he says, you don't belong to you. God, you belong to God. Look at verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So if we belong to God then when we work, when we serve in our ministry, whatever ministry it is, who are we serving? God. And that means, that's, I think, is part of the reason why Paul, um, or maybe it's Peter says it too, but um, says that when you're, you are working for an employer or a slave to a master, do it as if you're serving the Lord. Because that's what everything we do, we, we owe everything to him. So everything we do should be done with that attitude, serving God no matter what. So we are obligated, obligated to live for God, obligated to recognize that our life is not our own and we belong to God. And that is because he has um, made us into new Creations or new creatures. Go back to Second Corinthians five, and uh, as we look at this, we look at uh, verses sixteen and seventeen. He says, "Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh? Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more." And that's a hard thing to understand, but I think the the gist of it, he's saying, listen, at one time, all you could think of, the only way you could think was uh, as a human being in the flesh, and you could recognize who Jesus was in the flesh, not his flesh, but your own flesh. You're looking at, at him from the standpoint of a simple 
simple, <laughs> of a human being who has not been changed by the uh, by uh, in salvation. So we we look, and people around us can look at Christianity. They can look at at God. They can look at the crucifixion, but they're looking at it from the standpoint of a fallen human being. And so at one point, that's the way we looked at Christ. But now, and what's it, what does henceforth mean? Going forward or from now on, we look at Christ with the eyes of spiritually minded people. People who have been changed by the Spirit of God. Look at the next verse. Therefore, therefore, okay, that means because of this, what I just read, we're looking at Christ uh, not after the flesh anymore. Because of that, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. <coughs> Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we can talk about that again, but I'm not going to do that. You just look at the picture of the butterfly or the uh, frog. It used to be a tadpole. It's just a whole metamorphosis, a change. And that's the way we are. We were just had, we just had the, only the, the uh, old nature, the old man, the way every human being uh, has been born since Adam. Adam and Eve. Okay, they're born with the, the old nature, the sinful nature. And uh, now, though, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are new. Uh, go over to Titus chapter 3. And verse number 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Now that he's saying it's not by works, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now you see two words there, regeneration and renewing. What's the difference? I mean, they're two different words, but... Okay, they're basically telling you the same thing. Um, to renew something, <laughs> there used to be a, I don't know, maybe it's still around, a wax. It was a Johnson's Wax Renew. Tim knows about that. We've heard it advertised on old radio shows. But uh, what was what did it do? It took, put the wax on the floor. You wash the floor and wax it, and it looks brand new. Okay, it's changed, and it's like you walk into this linoleum and or this tile floor and say, wow, when did you put this in, last week? Because it's almost like brand new. So renewing is just making it like new. Regeneration. Um, what does a generator do? Anybody? Recharge. Recharges. Uh, uh, they don't use very often, I guess. I don't know, maybe the old old machines, they still have generators on cars. Now they call them alternators. And what it does is sends it, it run, the car runs the, the generator and it generates electricity to recharge your battery while you're driving the car. Uses a lot of it. Uh, if you just want to charge your battery, you're using a lot of gas to, to do that. But it charges. To regenerate is to start over again. If your, if your battery was totally dead, the generator sends out the, the electricity to put the juice back in the battery. So when we are regenerated, we are born all over again. The word generate is it's where we get the word Genesis. What is Genesis in the book of, in the Bible? The very beginning. It's the start of the world. And so he says, by the washing of regeneration. God washes us clean of our sin and we start all over again. Wow. That's uh, when you think about that, just all these things that, that how God tells us what he has done for us by the washing of regeneration. Uh, we are born all over again. Look what Peter says. And Peter says it uh, really close to the way Jesus says it. First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 23. Peter says, being born again. 
not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. What is what is the corruptible seed that he's talking about? Hmm? Sin nature. Sin nature or the human nature. Corruptible seeds. What when we when we die, our bodies are corruptible and they decompose. And this is what he's saying. He's saying you're being you're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Now he doesn't use the word seed there, but that's just the point. Incorruptible. If our bodies are corruptible, what is it that is incorruptible? The spirit. Right. So so he's saying we are born of the spirit by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So he uses the words born again. What's the difference? And I've talked about it, so I want to see how many people remember or if anybody remembers. What is the difference between uh, the, his words here, born again, and the words that Jesus uses in John chapter 3 when he uses the words born again? Anybody? In, in English, they're the same words. Jose? Born from above. Where's that? John 3. John 3. And what is this one? Huh? And what is this one in, in 1 Peter? Is it from above? No, it's not. I'll, I'll answer it. It means born all over again. Again means again. Okay, when, that's the way we use it today. But in John chapter 3, as Jose said, Jesus says he uses a different word than Peter does here. He says, you must be born again. You must be born from above. Now remember what, what Nicodemus thought when Jesus said that. He didn't, he didn't think, oh, Jesus said you need to be born from above. What was his answer when Jesus said he must be born again? Yeah, he says, well, can a man go back into his mother's womb and be born all over again? And Jesus said no, and he, he explained things, but he never said uh, to be born from above. He just talks about the Spirit. Well, let's look at it. Go over to John chapter 3. Because he's talking about being born of incorruptible seed. The Spirit, born of the Spirit. <laughs> So Nicodemus comes to him, and Jesus said this, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say, what does verily mean? Truly, truly. And what, what other word is translated uh, from this, uh, the Greek here? Anybody know what other word is translated? Amen. Okay, amen means, means the, I, I agree, it's, it's, it's the truth. Okay, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus says his question, or his statement, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother, whom and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, corruptible, is flesh or corruptible. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit, and it's incorruptible. So both Peter and, and Jesus are saying the same thing, only Jesus says you need to be born from above. Peter says you need to be born all over again. You need to be regenerated, start over. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are starting over, and we are those new creatures uh, new creation that Paul talks about there in 2 Corinthians. The spiritual birth then is the only way a person can be reconciled to God. Now what, again, what, is, what does reconcile mean? Anybody? What's that? Set, set right and balanced. Right. Well, I use the, 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 the bank statement all the time. But it's really, it's, 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 when you think about in this case, when we're talking about reconciliation, it's bringing, setting right a relationship between two individuals. Let's just look at me for a second, a little bit, just as an example. Not 
because anything special about me, but you, you can be me and you can be in my place. Before I know, before I was um, uh, uh, reconciled to God, I was his enemy because I had sin that was not, I mean, it was, it was, it was paid for in Christ, but I had never accepted God's forgiveness of that sin. And so I was at odds with God. You know what that means, at odds with God? Enemies. We were at, in, at enmity with one another. But he, God, is always reaching out to everybody in the world. Always. Okay? And, and so I needed to be at one with him. Now that's where we, we get we can say the, the word atonement, at onement. I needed to be even with him. The Bible the Bible teaches that um, for all uh, how does it go? Uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How close is the closest person to the glory of God without Jesus Christ? When you're shaking your head, what does that mean? There's, there's, no. It's, there's no, nobody's closer. We're all infinitely uh, apart from Christ. We come, to say come short <laughs> is, is like in what they call an understatement. Now, we're nowhere near the righteousness of God or the glory of God. So uh, we need to have the righteousness of God so we can be reconciled to him. So how can anybody, this is, this is the, the, the amazing, one of the amazing things about what God has done for us. If God is absolutely, infinitely righteous, how is a person ever to get to be there? In Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the righteousness of God, infinite righteousness, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we know that God has given us the infinite righteousness of God. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, when you think, think about infinite righteousness, I have that? I do. I'm not infinitely righteous, but I have his infinite righteousness because we are reconciled to God when we uh, put our faith in Jesus Christ. It's through what God has done. We were enemies at one time. Isaiah 59 uh, verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. What's that sound like? That sounds like he blocks his ears and says, I don't want to hear you. I, just stay away from me. Uh, but it's not that way. What it is is we have turned our back on him. And so it's, it's as if when we speak, we speak this way, and he can't hear us because he's behind us. It's our fault, it's our problem, that we are separated from God. He's reaching out, and he wants to hear us say, I accept what you've done for me. I accept that gift of salvation. Go over to um, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and look at verse number 8. But God commendeth, or he shows us, his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Saved from what wrath? Hell. What is hell all about? It's the lake of fire that God has created for uh, the devil and his angels. And, uh, the, and that's where God pours out his wrath on the evil that has been in this world. And so if we do not, if we reject, if a person rejects Jesus Christ, then they will receive the wrath of God. So he says, uh, we, we save from wrath through him, through Christ. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, 
And keep that in mind by the death of his son. Uh, it says, being now just, um, we were enemies, we're reconciled to God. <laughs> Are enemies of God reconciled to him without Christ? No, so you can't you can't say uh, for for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God because we can't be reconciled if we're still enemies. So it's the death of Christ and what Christ has done that makes it possible for us to be reconciled. Uh, it's by the death of His Son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Christ died, and we died in him, with him when we put our faith in Christ. He rose from the dead, and he is alive, and so we will live with him. And so he's saying we will be saved by his life. Because he is risen, we will also rise. Uh, we are, need to be reconciled to God. And that's what uh, Paul is getting to there in Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5. And look at... Um, Well, let's start at verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So what is ministry? What is a ministry? <laughs> it's, a real, it's a real simple word. I'll, I'll give you a, an answer, and it's just three letters. What is a ministry? Serve. serve is five letter that's right serve a job okay a job is two three three letters the ministry of reconciliation it is our job it is our service as um, Amy said we serve the Lord in this ministry of reconciliation to wit I had to look this up to wit anybody know <laughs> my uh my uncle, my, my uh, aunt's husband, was named Carl Witt. And uh, they used to joke about it, and they said, well, we're, we're a bunch of those people who weren't uh, full wits. They were only half wits. But what's a wit? What does, what does it mean to wit? This is one of the very few places in Scripture where it's not in italics. This is really, it's, it's a translation here of, of, a, of a word. Does anybody know what to wit means? Because. What's that? Because. because, or in this way. Okay. He says, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. God has, verse 18, God's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. For this reason, or in this way, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Now, how can anybody be reconciled to God. They need to know the truth of what God has done. He says, uh, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. There it is, the word of reconciliation. We have the responsibility to tell what God has done. That's our ministry of reconciliation. Now, he says here in, in verse 19, he says that God uh, was in Christ, how does he, how does he say it, um, not imputing their trans trespasses unto them. What does imputing mean? Hold, putting it on their account or holding them accountable for their, their sins. He says, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So in Christ, God placed on, all of our sin. Well, I've said this, but this, this is a verse that shows it also. God placed all of man, the sins of mankind on Jesus Christ. So in Christ here, he says, reconciling, God was reconciling the world uh, to himself, not putting their sins on their account. Instead of our sins being on our account, they're on Christ. Does that mean, when he says that he's reconciling the world to himself, does that mean everybody's reconciled to God? No. It means that 
nobody's sins are on their account. The whole, the world, and that goes all the way back to Adam. And it goes all the way up to wherever God ends the world. All of the sins are on Jesus Christ. And he does not impute or put our sins on our account. It's gone. Now, now today, maybe tomorrow, maybe before the service is over, somebody will sin. Where does that sin go? How, how are you or I going to pay for that sin that we commit today? No place. You commit the sin, it's on Jesus. That's that's one of those, that's just a, it's a weird way of thinking, but it's the truth. Jesus paid for the sins that you're going to commit today and tomorrow and for the rest of your life. You, their, your sins are not going to be on your account. He's not going to look at you and open up his uh, book of sins, uh, your book, and everybody, I mean, I don't know, no, God doesn't have books of everybody's sins, but just think of it. Here's, here's the book. It says Ken Butler here. And this is the one, Ken Butler, who was the pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church, because there's probably a thousand Ken Butlers in the world. And so you open, he opens up the book, and he says, okay, I'm going to point out your sins to you. There's nothing there. Why? It's on Jesus. It's not on my account. Not imputing their sins to them or their trespasses to them. And so, this, these truths here, so I'm not reading now, but these truths, he says, uh, he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And he goes on to say, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. I was, uh, uh, when I was a little kid, fifth, fifth grade, sixth grade, I was in the Southern Baptist Church, and they had a group called Royal Ambassadors. And uh, that, uh, that was our verse. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. So that's the statement. That was our motto. And uh, we are all ambassadors. What is an ambassador? Let me, let me read a, a definition of an ambassador. I think I got this from uh, Webster's Old Dictionary, 1828. An ambassador is a minister of the highest rank employed by one prince or state at the court of another to manage the public concerns of his own prince or state and representing the power and dignity of his sovereign. So we are ambassadors. We are the minister of the highest rank for God in from his court, from his throne to this world. We don't belong here. We are citizens of heaven. And so God, in a, in, in, without us going to heaven and him sending us down, we become citizens of heaven. And he says, okay, you are my ambassadors now to this world. And we have the responsibility, the obligation, to present the truth of how God reconciles the world to the world. Because we are new creatures, again, not citizens of this world. We're ambassadors from heaven to the world, and we should be giving the word of reconciliation. Let's finish verse, the two verses there. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. He says, uh, being, a, being an ambassador, it's as if God said, uh, God is beseeching you to be reconciled to God. But instead of God speaking to you, we're speaking on his behalf. We are in his place or Christ's place to give the truth of what God has done. For he hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who, Christ, knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God, and there it is, the infinite righteousness of God 
in Jesus Christ. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have his infinite righteousness. Uh, and that's what's going to, that's what is uh, making it possible for us to be with God, reconciled to him, because we have his righteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. Lord, help us to be the ambassadors we should be to make known to others the truth of what you've done for us. Guide us now as we go into our worship service. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.